there has been much written and much said by some people who have looked at all the changes that have occurred in American society in the past 20 years or so, and who have looked then retrospectively to earlier history of the United States and indeed of the world, and come to the conclusion that there is a that there is a conspiracy of sorts <clears throat> which influences, indeed controls, major historical events not only in the United States but around the world. This conspiratorial interpretation of history is based on people making observations from the outside, gathering evidence, and coming to the conclusion that from the outside they see a conspiracy. Their evidence and conclusion are based on evidence gathered in retrospect, period. I want to now describe what I heard from a speaker in 1969, which in several weeks will now be 20 years ago. The speaker did not speak in terms of retrospect, but rather predicting changes that would be brought about in the future. The speaker was not looking from the outside in, thinking that he saw conspiracy, rather he was on the inside, admitting that indeed there was an organized power force, group of men, who wielded enough influence to determine major events involving countries around the world, and he predicted or uh, rather expounded on uh, changes that were planned for the remainder of this century. As you listen, if you can recall the situation, at least in the United States in 1969 and the few years thereafter, and then recall the kinds of changes which have occurred between then and now, almost 20 years later. I believe you'll be impressed with the degree to which the things that were planned to be brought about have already been accomplished. Some of the things that uh, were discussed uh, were not intended to be accomplished yet by 1988. Uh, but are intended to be accomplished uh, before the end of this century. There is a timetable, and uh, it was during this uh, session that, uh, that some of the elements of the timetable were brought out. Uh, anyone who recalls early uh, in the days of the Kennedy presidency, uh, the Kennedy campaign, when he spoke of progress in the decade of the 60s. That was kind of a cliche in those days, the decade of the 60s. Well, by 1969, our speaker was talking about the decade of the 70s, the decade of the 80s, and the decade of the 90s. So that uh, I think that terminology, that way of looking, and looking at things and expressing things probably um, all comes from the same source. Prior to that time, I don't remember anybody saying the decade of the 40s and the decade of the 50s. So I think this uh, overall plan and timetable uh, had taken important shape with more predictability to those who control it uh, sometime in the late 50s. That's speculation on my part. In any event, the speaker said that <clears throat> His purpose was to tell us about changes which would be brought about in the next uh, 30 years or so, so that an entirely new worldwide system would be in operation before the turn of the century. As he put it, uh, we plan to enter the 21st century with a running start. He said as we listened to what he was about to present, he said, some of you will think I'm talking about communism. Well, what I'm talking about is much bigger than communism. Um, 
And at that time, he indicated there is much more cooperation between East and West than most people realize. In his introductory remarks, he commented that uh, he was free to speak at this time. He would not have been able to say what he was about to say even a few years earlier, but he was free to speak at this time because now, and I'm quoting here, everything is in place and nobody can stop us now. That's the end of that quotation. He went on to say that most people don't understand how governments operate and even people in high positions in governments, including our own, don't really understand how and where decisions are made. He went on to say that um, he went on to say that the people who really influence decisions are names that, for the most part, would be familiar to most of us. But he would not use individuals' names or names of any specific organizations. But that if he did, most of the people would be names that were recognized by most uh, of his audience. He went on to say that they were not primarily people in public office, but uh, people of prominence who were primarily known in their uh, private occupations or private positions. The speaker was a doctor of medicine, a former professor at a large Eastern University, and he was addressing a group of doctors of medicine, about 80 in number. Uh, his name would not be widely recognized by anybody likely to hear this, and so there's no point in giving his name. The only purpose in recording this is that uh, it may give a perspective to those who hear it regarding the changes which have already been uh, accomplished in the past 20 years or so, and a bit of a preview to what at least some people are planning for the remainder of this century, so that we or they would enter the 21st century with a flying start. Some of us may not enter that century. His purpose in telling our group about these changes that were to be brought about uh, was to make it easier for us to adapt to these changes. Indeed, as he quite accurately said, uh, they would be changes that uh, would be very surprising and in some ways uh, difficult for people to accept. And he hoped that uh, we, as sort of his friends, would uh, make the adaptation more easily if we knew somewhat beforehand what, uh, what to expect. Somewhere in the introductory remarks, he insisted that nobody have a tape recorder and that nobody take notes, which for a professor was a very remarkable kind of thing to uh, expect from an audience. Something in his remarks suggested that uh, there could be negative repercussions against him if, his, if it became widely known uh, what he was about to say to to our group, if it became widely known that indeed he had spilled the beans, so to speak. Um, when I first heard that, I thought maybe that was sort of an ego trip, somebody enhancing uh, his own importance. But as the uh, revelations unfolded, I began to understand why he might have had some concern about not having it widely known what was said, although this, although this was a fairly public forum where he was speaking. Remarks were delivered, but nonetheless he asked that uh, no notes be taken, no tape recorder be used, uh, suggesting there might be some personal danger to himself uh, if these revelations were uh, widely publicized. Again, as the remarks began to unfold and some of the rather outrageous things that were said at that time, they certainly seemed outrageous, uh, I made it a point to try to remember as much of what he said as I could and during the subsequent weeks and months and years to connect my recollections to simple events around me.
uh, both to aid my memory for the future, in case I wanted to do what I'm doing now, record this, and also to uh, try to maintain a perspective on what would be developing if indeed it followed the predicted pattern, which it has at this point so that I don't forget to uh, include it later. I'll just include some statements that were made from time to time throughout the presentation. Um, just having general bearing on the, the whole presentation. One of the statements was having to do with change. Uh, people get used, the statement was people will have to get used to the idea of change. So used to change that uh, they'll be expecting change. Nothing will be permanent. This often came out in the context of a society of uh, where, where people seem to have no roots or, or moorings, uh, but would be passively willing to accept change simply because that was all they had ever known. This was sort of in contrast to uh, generations of people up until this time where certain things you expect to be and remain in place uh, as reference points for your life. So change was to be brought about, change was to be anticipated and expected and accepted, no questions asked. Another comment that was made uh, from time to time during the presentation was, people are too trusting people don't ask the right questions. Sometimes being too trusting was equated with being too dumb. <coughs> but sometimes when, when he would say that and say people don't ask the right questions, uh, it was almost with a sense of regret as if he were uneasy with what uh, he was a part of and wished that uh, people would challenge it and uh, maybe not be so trusting. Another comment that was repeated from time to time uh, this particularly in relation to changing laws and customs and uh, specific changes. He, he said, everything has two purposes. One is the ostensible purpose, which will make it acceptable to people. And second is the real purpose, uh, which would further the goals of establishing the new system and having it. Frequently, he would say, there's no other way. There's just no other way. This seemed to uh, come as a, sort of an apology, uh, particularly when at the conclusion of uh, describing some particularly offensive changes, for example, uh, the promotion of drug addiction, which we'll get into shortly. He was very active with population control groups, the population control movement, and population control was really the entry point into specifics following the introduction. Uh, he said the population is growing too fast. Numbers uh, of people living at any one time on the planet must be limited or we will run out of space to live. We will outgrow our food supply and we will over pollute the world with our waste. People won't be allowed to have babies just because they want to or because they are careless. Most families would be limited to two. Some people would be allowed only one, and the outstanding person or persons might be selected uh, and allowed to have three, but most people would allow to have uh, only two babies. That's because the zero population growth uh, is 2.1 children per completed family, so something like every tenth family might be allowed the privilege of the third baby. To me, up to this point, the word population control uh, primarily connoted uh, limiting the number of babies to be born, but uh, this remark about what people would be allowed and then what followed made it quite clear that when you hear population control, that means more than just controlling births. It means control of every endeavor of, an ent of the entire world population. Uh, a much broader meaning to that term than I had uh, ever attached to it before hearing this. As you listen and reflect back on uh, some of the things you hear, you will begin to uh, recognize how one aspect 
dovetails with other aspects in terms of controlling human endeavors. Well, from population control, a natural next step then was sex. Uh, he said sex must be separated from reproduction. Sex is too pleasurable and the urges are too strong to expect people to give it up. Chemicals in food and in the water supply to reduce the sex drive are not practical. The strategy then would be not to diminish sex activity, but to increase sex activity, but in such a way that people won't be having babies. And the first consideration then uh, here was contraception. Contraception would be uh, very strongly encouraged uh, and it would be connected so closely in people's minds with sex that they would automatically think contraception when they were thinking or preparing for sex. And contraceptives would be made universally available. Nobody wanting contraception would be uh, find that they were unavailable. Contraceptives would be displayed uh, much more prominently in drugstores and right up with the uh, cigarettes and the chewing gum out in the open rather than hidden under the counter where people would have to ask for them and maybe be embarrassed. This kind of openness was a way of uh, suggesting that uh, contraceptions are, contraceptives are just as much part of life as uh, any other item sold in the store. And contraceptives would be advertised. And contraceptives would be dispensed in the schools in association with sex education. The sex education was to get kids interested early, uh, making the connection between sex and the need for contraception early in their lives, even before they became very active. At this point, I was recalling some of my teachers, particularly in high school, and found it totally unbelievable to think of them agreeing to, much less participating in distributing contraceptives to students. But uh, that only reflected my lack of understanding of how these people operate. That was before the school-based clinic uh, programs got started. Many, many cities in the United States by this time uh, have already set up school-based clinics, which uh, are primarily contraception, birth control, population control clinics. The idea then is that the uh, connection between sex and contraception uh, introduced and reinforced in school would carry over into marriage. Indeed, if uh, young people, when they matured, decided to get married, uh, marriage itself would be uh, diminished in importance. Uh, and he indicated some recognition that most people probably would want to be married, but that uh, this certainly would not be any longer considered to be necessary uh, for sexual activity. No surprise then that the next item was abortion. And this, now back in 1969, four years before Roe v. Wade, uh, he said abortion will no longer be a crime. Uh, abortion would be accepted as normal and would be paid for by taxes for people who could not pay for their own abortions. Contraceptives would be made available by tax money so that uh, nobody would have to do without contraceptives. If school sex programs would lead to more pregnancies in children, that was really seen as no problem. Uh, parents who think they are opposed to abortion on moral or religious grounds will change their minds when it is their own child who is pregnant. So this will help overcome opposition to abortion. Before long, only a few diehards will still refuse to see abortion as acceptable, and they won't matter anymore. Homosexuality also was to be encouraged. Uh, people will be given permission to be homosexuals. That's the way it was stated. They won't have to hide it. And elderly people will be encouraged to continue uh, to have active sex lives uh, into their very old ages as long as they can. Uh, everyone will be given permission to have sex to enjoy however they want. Anything goes. This is the way it was put. <clears throat> and I remember thinking uh, how arrogant for this individual or whoever he represents 
to feel that they can give or withhold permission for people to do things. But those, that was the terminology that was used. In this regard, uh, clothing was mentioned. Clothing styles would be made more stimulating and provocative. Recall uh, back in 1969 was the time of the, the miniskirt when they were, those miniskirts were very, very high and very revealing. Uh, he said it's not just the amount of skin that is expressed, exposed, that makes clothing sexually seductive, but other more subtle things are often more suggestive. Uh, things like movement and the cut of clothing and the uh, kind of fabric, the positioning of uh, accessories on the clothing. If a woman has an attractive body, why should she not show it, was uh, one of the statements. There's uh, was not detail on what was meant by provocative clothing, but uh, since that time, if you watch the changes in clothing styles, uh, blue jeans are cut in a way that they're much more tight-fitting through the crotch. Uh, they form wrinkles. Uh, wrinkles essentially are arrows, uh, lines which direct one's vision to certain anatomic areas. And this was around the time of the uh, burn your bra activity. Um, he indicated that a lot of women should not go without a bra. They need a bra to be attractive. So instead of banning bras and burning them, uh, bras would come back, but uh, they would be thinner and softer, allowing more natural movement. Um, and uh, it was not specifically stated, but certainly a very thin bra is much more revealing of uh, the nipple and what else is underneath. Uh, than the heavier bras that were in style up to that time. Technology. Uh, earlier he said uh, sex and reproduction would be separated. You would have sex without reproduction and then technology was reproduction without sex. Uh, this would be done in the laboratory. Indicated already much, much research was underway uh, about uh, making babies in the laboratory. There was some elaboration on that, but I don't remember the details, uh, how much of that technology has come to my attention since that time. I don't remember. I don't remember in a way that I can distinguish what was said from what I subsequently have just learned uh, as general medical information. Families. Families would be limited in size. Uh, we already alluded to uh, not being allowed to have more than two children. Divorce would be made easier and more prevalent. Most people who marry will marry more than once. More people will not marry. Unmarried people uh, would stay in hotels and even live together. Uh, that would be very common. Nobody would even ask questions about it. It would be widely accepted as uh, no different from married people being together. More women will work outside the home. More men will be transferred to other cities in their jobs. More men would travel in their work. Therefore, it would be harder for families to stay together. Um, this would tend to uh, make the married relationship less stable and therefore tend to make people less willing to have babies. And the extended family would be smaller and more remote. Travel would be easier, less expensive for a while, so that people who did have to travel would uh, feel that they could get back to their families, uh, not that they were abruptly being uh, made remote from their families. But uh, one of the net effects of uh, easier divorce laws, uh, combined with the promotion of travel and transferring families from one city to another was to create instability in the families. Uh, if both husband and wife are working and one partner gets transferred, the other one may not be easily transferred. So one either gives up his or her job and stays behind while the other leaves, or else gives up the job and risks uh, not finding employment in the new location. Rather uh, diabolical approach to uh, this whole thing. Uh, euthanasia. Everybody has a right to live only so long 
The old are no longer useful. They become a burden. You should be ready to accept death. Uh, most people are. An arbitrary age limit could be established. After all, you have a right to only so many steak dinners, and so many orgasms, and so many good pleasures in life. And after you've had enough of them, and you're no longer productive in working and contributing, then you should be ready to step aside uh, for the uh, next generation. Some things that would help people realize that they had lived long enough. He mentioned several of these. I don't remember them all. Here are a few. Uh, the use of very pale printing ink on forms that people uh, necessary uh, to fill out so that older people wouldn't be able to read the pale ink as easily and would need to go to younger people for help. Automobile traffic patterns. There would be more high-speed uh, traffic lanes, uh, traffic patterns that would older people, would, with their slower reflexes, would have trouble dealing with uh, and thus uh, tend to lose some of their independence. Big item uh, which was elaborated at some length was the cost of medical care would be made burdensomely high. Uh, medical care would be uh, connected very closely with one's work, but also would be made very, very high in cost so that uh, uh, it would simply be unavailable to people beyond a certain time. And unless they had a remarkably rich supporting family, uh, they would just have to do without care. And uh, the idea was that if uh, everybody sees enough uh, what a burden it is on the young to try to maintain the old people, uh, then the young would become agreeable to helping mom and dad along the way, uh, provided that this was done humanely and with dignity. And then the example was uh, there could be like a nice farewell party a real celebration, uh, mom and dad had done a good job, and then after the party's over, I take the demise pill. The next topic is medicine. Uh, there would be profound changes in the practice of medicine. Overall, medicine would be much more tightly controlled. The observation was made, Congress is not going to go along uh, with national health insurance. That, in 1969, he said, is now abundantly uh, evident, but it's not necessary. We have other ways to control health care. Uh, these will come about more gradually, but all health care delivery would come under tight control. Uh, medical care would be closely connected to work. If you don't work or can't work, you won't have access to medical care. Uh, the days of hospitals giving away free care would gradually wind down until that was virtually non-existent. Costs would be forced up so that people won't be able to afford to go without insurance. People pay. You pay for it, you're entitled to it. It was only subsequently that I began to realize uh, the extent to which you would not be paying for it. Your medical care would be paid for by others, and therefore you would uh, gratefully accept on bended knee what was offered to you as a privilege. Uh, your role uh, re being responsible for your own care would be diminished. As an aside here, this is not something that was developed at the time. I uh, didn't understand at the time. But as an aside, the way this works, everybody's made dependent on insurance. And if you don't have insurance and you pay directly, the cost of your care is enormous. The insurance company, however, paying for your care does not pay that same amount. If you are charged, uh, say, $600 for the use of an operating room, the insurance company does not pay $600 on your part. They pay three or $400. Uh, and that differential in billing uh, has the desired effect. It enables the insurance company to pay for that which you could never pay for. They get a discount that's unavailable to you. When you see your bill, you're grateful that the insurance company can do that. Uh, and in this way, you are dependent and virtually required to have insurance. The whole billing is uh, fraudulent. Anyhow, continuing on now, um, <clears throat> access to hospitals would be tightly controlled. Uh, identification would be needed to get into the building. Security in and around hospitals would be established and gradually increased. 
so that uh, nobody without identification could get in or move around inside the building. Theft of hospital equipment, things like typewriters and microscopes and so forth, would be uh, allowed and uh, exaggerated, reports of it would be exaggerated, so that this would be the excuse needed to establish the need for strict security until people got used to it. Uh, and anybody moving about in a hospital would be required to wear an identification badge with uh, a photograph and telling uh, why he was there, uh, employee or lab technician or visitor or whatever. And this is to be brought in gradually, getting everybody used to the idea of identifying themselves uh, until it was just accepted. This need for ID to move about uh, would start in small ways, um, hospitals, some businesses, but gradually expand to include everybody in all places. It was observed that hospitals can be used to confine people uh, for the treatment of criminals. This did not mean necessarily medical treatment. Uh, at, at, that, at that time, I did not know the word psycho prison, as in the Soviet Union, but uh, uh, without trying to recall all the details, basically it was uh, describing the use of hospitals both for treating the sick and for confinement of criminals for reasons other than the medical well-being of the criminal. Definition of criminal was not given. The image of the doctor would change. No longer would he be seen as an individual professional in service to individual patients. But the doctor would be uh, gradually uh, recognized as a highly skilled technician um, and uh, his job would change. The job uh, is to include uh, things like executions by lethal injection. Uh, the image of the doctor as being a powerful independent person would have to be changed. And he went on to say, uh, doctors that make entirely too much money, uh, they should advertise like any other product. Lawyers would be advertising too. <coughs> Uh, keep in mind, this was a, an audience of doctors being addressed by a doctor, and it was uh, interesting that he would make uh, some rather insulting statements to his audience uh, without fear of uh, antagonizing us. The solo practitioner would become a thing of the past. Uh, a few diehards might try to hold out, but most uh, doctors would be employed by an institution of one kind or another. Uh, group practice would be encouraged, uh, corporations would be encouraged, and then once the corporate image of medical care, uh, as this gradually became more and more acceptable, doctors would more and more become employees rather than independent contractors. And along with that, of course, uh, unstated but necessary is the employee serves his employer, not his patient. So that's, uh, and we've already seen quite a lot of that uh, in the last 20 years, and apparently more on the horizon. Uh, the term HMO was not used at that time, but as you look at HMOs, uh, uh, you see this is the uh, way that uh, medical care is being taken over since the national health insurance approach uh, did not uh, get through the Congress. A few diehard doctors may try to uh, make go of it remaining in solo practice, uh, remaining independent, which parenthetically is me. Um, but they would suffer uh, great loss of income. They'd be able to scrape by maybe, but uh, never uh, really live comfortably as those who were willing to become employees of the system. Ultimately, there would be no room at all for the solo practitioner after the system is entrenched. Uh, next heading to talk about is health and disease. He said there would be new diseases to appear, which uh, had not ever been seen before would be very difficult to diagnose and be untreatable, uh, at least for a long time. No elaboration was made on this, but uh, I remember not long after hearing this presentation when I had a puzzling uh, diagnosis to make, I would be wondering, is this what he was talking about? Is this a case of what he was talking about? Uh, some years later, uh, as AIDS uh, ultimately developed, I think AIDS was at least one example of what he was talking about. <clears throat>
I now think that AIDS probably is a manufactured disease. Cancer. He said, we can cure almost every cancer right now. Information is on file in the Rockefeller Institute uh, if it's ever decided that it should be released. But consider, if people stop dying of cancer, how rapidly we would become overpopulated. You may as well die of cancer or something else. Efforts at cancer treatment would be geared more toward uh, comfort than toward cure. There was some statement that ultimately the cancer cures which were being hidden in the Rockefeller Institute would come to light because independent researchers might uh, bring them out uh, despite these efforts to suppress them. But at least for the time being, uh, letting people die of cancer uh, was a good thing to do because it would uh, slow down the problem of overpopulation. Another very interesting thing was heart attacks. Uh, he said, there is now a way to simulate a real heart attack. It can be used as a means of assassination. Only a very skilled pathologist who knew exactly what to look for at an autopsy could distinguish this from the real thing. I thought that was a very surprising and shocking thing to hear from this particular man at that particular time. Uh, this and business of the cancer cure really still stand out sharply in my memory because they were so shocking and at that time seemed to me out of character. He then went on to talk about nutrition and exercise uh, sort of in the same framework. People would not have to, people would have to eat right and exercise right to live as long as before. Most won't. Uh, this in the connection of uh, nutrition, there was no specific statement that I can recall as to particular nutrients that would be either uh, inadequate or in excess. In retrospect, I tend to think he meant high salt diets and high fat diets would predispose toward uh, high blood pressure and premature arteriosclerotic heart disease and that if people were too dumb or too lazy to exercise as they should, then their uh, dietary, their uh, circulating fats would go up and predispose to disease. And he said something about diet information, about proper diet would be widely available, but most people, uh, particularly stupid people who had no right to continue living anyway, um, they would ignore the advice and just go on and eat what was convenient and tasted good. There were some other unpleasant things said about food. I just can't recall what they were, but I do remember of uh, having uh, reflections about wanting to plant a garden in the backyard to get around whatever these contaminated foods would be. Uh, I regret I don't remember the details. Uh, the rest of this about nutrition and uh, hazardous nutrition. Uh, with regard to exercise, he went on to say that uh, more people would be exercising more, especially running, uh, because every everybody can run. You don't need any special equipment or place. Uh, you can run wherever you are. Uh, as he put it, people will be running all over the place. And uh, in this vein, he pointed out how supply produces demand, and this was in reference to athletic clothing and equipment, uh, as this would be uh, made uh, more widely available and glamorized, uh, particularly as regards running shoes. Uh, this would stimulate people to uh, develop an interest in running and as part of a whole sort of public propaganda campaign, people would be encouraged then to uh, buy the uh, attractive sports equipment and to uh, get into exercise. Again, uh, well, in connection with nutrition, he also mentioned that uh, public eating places would rapidly increase. It, uh, uh, this had a connection with the family too, as more and more people ate out, eating at home would become less important. Uh, people would be less dependent on their kitchens at home. And then this also connected to uh, convenience foods being made widely available. Uh, things like you could pop into the microwave. Uh, whole meals would be uh, available prefixed. And of course, we've now seen this uh, in some pretty good ones. But this whole different approach to 
eating out and to uh, uh, previously uh, prepared meals being eaten in the home was uh, predicted at the time to be brought about uh, convenience foods. And uh, the convenience foods that would be part of the hazard, anybody who was uh, lazy enough to want the convenience foods rather than fixing his own also better be energetic enough to exercise uh, because if he was too lazy to exercise and too lazy to uh, fix his own food, uh, then he didn't deserve to live very long. This was all presented as sort of a moral judgment about people and what they should do with their energies. People who are smart, who would learn about nutrition and who are disciplined enough to eat right and exercise right are better people and are the kind you want to live longer. Somewhere along in here there is also something uh, about accelerating the onset of puberty. And this was said in connection with health and later in connection with education and connected to accelerating the process of evolutionary change. There was a statement that we think we can push evolution faster and in the direction we want it to go. I remember this only as a general statement. I don't recall if any uh, details were given uh, beyond that. Another area of discussion was religion. Uh, this is a, an avowed atheist speaking. Uh, and he said, religion is not necessarily bad. A lot of people seem to need religion with its mysteries and rituals, so they will have religion. But the major re religions of today have to be changed because they are not compatible with the changes to come. The old religions will have to go, especially Christianity. Once the Roman Catholic Church is brought down, the rest of Christianity will follow easily. Then a new religion can be accepted for use all over the world. It will incorporate something from all of the old ones to make it more easy for people to accept it and feel at home in it. Most people won't be too concerned with religion. They will realize that they don't need it. In order to do this, the Bible will be changed. It will be rewritten to fit the new religion. Gradually, key words will be replaced with, with new words having various shades of meaning. Then the meaning attached to the new word uh, can be close to the old word, and as time goes on, other shades of meaning of that word can be 